As kids were often asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And somewhere along the way, our dreams of being a professional athlete, famous singer, or firefighter become a distant memory, replaced by the reality of the lives we now live. While your dreams may have faded or changed, God has a plan for your life. Discerning God's will might be less about uncovering some grand vision and more about having the courage to dream again. So what would it look like to begin the year not focused on goals or things to achieve, but on divine dreams that are more in reach than they seem? Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Willow. Um, So good to be with you today. Um, We are finishing up our series, Divine Dreams. Uh, It's been a powerful series, and we've been looking at the story of Joseph found in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. Um, And if there's anything that uh, you take away from the story of Joseph, uh, one of the the things I want you to take away, the big idea is that uh, really that God will use other, what others might intend for evil in our life for his glory and for, and for our good. And so God will use what others might intend uh, f- to harm us, might intend for evil or bad or wrong on us, um, but he will use it and turn it for his glory and for our good. Now, as Haley mentioned, uh, we do have a sensitive video uh, that we're going to see in just a moment. It's a powerful story, um, but, um, but we really get to see what God does even when people literally walk through a dark, dark place. But Joseph's story is, is unique because Joseph's story begins with his, his brothers, his brothers who intended evil by selling him into slavery. But God intended it for good, and he found himself in Potiphar's house where he was viewed and found favor with Potiphar, and he was, uh, been, be, was able to see, oversee all of the household. He was able to have responsibility and, and really had favor with Potiphar and, and in his home. But Potiphar's wife intended evil with a false accusation. And Joseph was sent to jail, was sent to prison for two years. But it wasn't just any prison. It was actually a royal prison as God would have it. A prison that was really dedicated for those who was was in the royal court. And so he was able to discuss politics and and economy and and kingdom type leadership with those individuals. And of course, God intended it for good and, and Joseph was able to find favor with the prison warden and, and the warden made him leader or got to be overseeing all of those who were in prison. And so Joseph yet again found favor there. And God continued to do this and in the precise moment, um, there was this cupbearer in prison, if you know the story, and he had a dream and Joseph interprets the dream and sometime later, the cupbearer is finally freed from prison, and in his freedom, he forgot Joseph. He forgot about Joseph, and although he may not have intended evil on Joseph in that moment, here yet again, Joseph is experiencing another setback, uh, another hardship, and he's forgotten. But then in the precise moment, Sometime later, Pharaoh is needing a dream interpreter and the cupbearer says, oh, I know a guy. And he brings Joseph in and Joseph interprets the dream and explains that there's a famine that's coming and here is a very specific plan on how to get through this difficult season that is coming. And some of those moments where you see like, wow, that, that's amazing. Joseph in it all continued to credit the Lord for all that was happening, that he knows this because God revealed this dream to him, that God revealed this plan to him. 
I think there's a little point there that so often some of the things that we do in life where we actually want to input some creativity into the world or, or we want to incorporate a plan or a strategy that we created and we, we put it into our workplace and the places that we serve and, and we say, look it, we created this, but where did we get that idea? Where did that thought actually come from? We ought to recognize that it all came from the Lord. And Joseph here is continually crediting the Lord all along the way that this isn't happening by chance. I didn't just muster this up. It was God who revealed this to me. And so Pharaoh was, was so impressed, if you know this story, that he actually made Joseph second in command of the known world, Egypt at the time. Second in command. Only, the only one who, who had authority over Joseph was Pharaoh himself. This is a big deal. But I just went through years of the story of Joseph and we can assume that there was actual agony in this time. That throughout these years, there was a lot of setbacks and injustices and moments that were flat out just, Joseph was just forgotten. And time after time, he would take a step and all of a sudden, he'd be faithful only to run into another setback. And then he would be faithful only to run into another setback. Over and over again. From the time that Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery to the time he actually was with Pharaoh was 13 years. Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold into slavery. That was a bad senior year of high school for him, <laughs> to say the least. Can you imagine, though, you're only 17 and your life has completely changed. 13 years would pass until he would actually stand with Pharaoh. Those 13 years were not easy. Pain, suffering, and heartache was experienced during those years. But it would be 22 years until his brothers would finally come to him in their time of need. And this time, Joseph is the one in charge. Can you imagine if you were Joseph in that moment? What you would be thinking or maybe even feeling where now your offenders are coming before you. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have experienced all that pain and suffering. And now they're coming before him and you're in charge, right? Joseph's in charge. There's a lot of creativity we might have in that moment of how we ought to treat them. These brothers who were driven by jealousy and bitterness and hatred and did an evil that is inexplicable to their own brother and sold him like property. But Joseph, he saw something different. He had God's perspective in it all. And here's how Joseph responds when he actually is confronted by his brothers in Genesis 45, verse five. He says, and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Let me ask this rhetorical question. Was he sold or was he sent? Was Joseph sold or was Joseph sent? Because he says both in this one verse. The answer is yes. Both are true. There are two realities that he's actually expressing and we don't want to miss it. They are both true, but one is a greater truth. The first is the event and what actually happened. But the second is how Joseph is interpreting the whole story. One is what his brothers did. But the other is what Joseph decided about it. There is a great difference here. He's not negating the fact that they sold him. He's identifying and calling it out. 
but he's seeing a greater story and a greater perspective. He's saying, it is God who sent me through this path of life ahead of you to save lives. See, God can be trusted. In it all and through it all, even when we don't understand it, God can be trusted. And Joseph's story is testimony of that. Our stories, they can take turns that we don't necessarily anticipate or even desire. And that was certainly the case for Rebecca's story that we're about to show you. Rebecca's story is indescribable. Her story describes a darkness in this world that does exist. But even in those dark places, God is working his will in his way for his glory. I remember being told I was stupid, that I, this was all I could ever do, no one would ever love me, this is all I was good for. He dated me for six months, and then he invited me to move in with him. I thought that I had met the one. When we first got there, he told me to get dressed up, he was gonna take me out on the town, but instead he drove me to this dead-end street, and he parked the car along the curb and he said, I spent a lot of money to get you here, and you're gonna need to get that money back. And I thought, of course, you know, whatever I need to do to get a job, and he said, no, you're gonna go into that door right there, and it's an escort service, and you're gonna sign up. And when I started to say no, it's when he slapped me across the face. He said, you're gonna go in that room and you're gonna get my money back. When you're being trafficked, your trafficker definitely brainwashes you through a variety of ab abuse, um, sleep deprivation, food deprivation, threats to you and your family, threats to your children. You believe you're never getting out. If I just keep my head down and obey the rules, then someday I might be able to be okay. Over the next nearly six years, I ended up getting bought and sold between three different traffickers. I had been hospitalized for dehydration and overexhaustion. I've been to jail multiple times for solicitation related charges. I've been branded twice. Two men tattooed their names on my back. I've had my face broken in multiple places. I just wanted to die. And I tried to kill myself twice. It wasn't until a federal raid where my trafficker was finally arrested on tax evasion charges that I was finally able to grab my daughter and run. When I fled from my trafficker, I didn't think I would do anything with my life. I was sleeping on couches. I thought that I would work at a minimum wage job, live on food stamps as a single mom. I really had no clue what I was going to do. Little by little, I started to rebuild. Little by little, I'd go to school, take a night class, get a promotion. Little by little, my daughter and I got the support and the community that came around us. Over this time of rebuilding my life, I met this guy named Matt, and we got married. We started a family. I had been about two to three years escaped from my trafficker really had started to find a sense of normalcy with me and my husband and our two little kids. When one morning, I was drinking my cup of coffee, and I can remember the Lord saying, how can you sit here and do nothing? How can you sit here in your nice, comfy house with your warm cup of coffee when you know what it's like to be more afraid to go home than you are to get in a car with a stranger? I started by turning my story into a training. I wanted there to be a narrative, a call to action, or like a solution to my testimony. And I started looking for different mentoring opportunities. That's when I got introduced to the Global Leadership Summit. I wanted to sop up as much leadership <laughs> as I could since we laugh, but it's you know serious, like your traffickers don't teach you how to team build. And so 
I remember coming back from that summit and writing a manifesto that I would be a boot camp for future leaders, that I would let people learn in my nonprofit how they wanted to go after their dreams. And that's really where it started. I just wanted to start sharing my story. I wanted people to know that trafficking was happening. We had this big conference and workshop where we're teaching some really nuanced, like red flags for medical professionals. So this doctor attends the conference. The next day, he leaves the conference, goes back to his shift, and we got an email that said that very night, a young girl had come into the emergency room. He would have normally just dismissed her as a runaway that needed some maybe resources to get some drug help. But because of the training, he saw every single red flag that he had heard just the day before. And sure enough, this was a trafficked teenage girl that was sitting in ER for help. Because of this one training, that girl was able to get resources and into help that very same night. During that time of training all of these law enforcement and child welfare workers, we started to have survivors reach out and ask if we could mentor them on how to tell their story and how to make a difference in their communities. So with that, we started Elevate Academy, the largest online school for survivors in the world. We started with just five. Six years later, we have almost 900 students in 12 countries and spanning 400 US cities. My vision for the future would be able to continue to expand to make a real difference. I mean, sex for sale is out of control and it's gonna to continue to grow if we don't all start doing something. We have made so much progress in this fight against human trafficking, but there is still a lot of work to be done. If I wouldn't have pursued this, if I would have said no or been too scared, I think I would have missed out on my own healing. So not only did it help, all the people we're serving and, and to feel like maybe we've made a difference in the nation, but it also helped me. It helped me to be a better mom, helped me to be a better wife, helped me to overcome all of the things that I, I came into this work with. And now I get to really make a difference and our team's making a difference and our allies and our partners. Together, we're making a difference. No person or circumstance can stop God's plans and dreams for your life. God will bring redemption one way or another. God will bring redemption. And there are moments in life that try the human soul so violently that it causes us to just throw up our hands and say, I quit, I'm done, and we just walk away from it all. And there are times where this deep degree of discouragement sort of sneaks into our life. We cover it so well because discouragement at that degree is so bold, it will hide behind a smile behind the facade of a good morning or praise the Lord. But it will sit in our souls and tell us that there is no hope, that your life is worthless. So I'm going to say this, and I heard someone else say it. I don't know who, but this person was very smart. We may be products of our past, but we don't have to be prisoners of it. You and I may be products of all the experiences that we've had up until today and this very moment, but you don't have to be prisoners of it. You don't have to sit in chain and bondage of all that happened to you. You can be freed from it. And in the story of Joseph, Joseph is able to find a way to forgive his offenders. 
He can see things through God's perspective. Yes, you sold me, but it was God who sent me ahead of you. I can see it, and I can see it clearly. So he's able to offer forgiveness to his brothers. And you might be here and you're saying, there's no way I could ever offer forgiveness. And oftentimes when we talk about forgiveness, people usually say they don't deserve forgiveness. And you might be right. They don't deserve forgiveness. But the question we ought to be asking is not how much forgiveness do they deserve. The question is how much freedom do I desire? Because with forgiveness, we become free to fully live into God's plan and who he's called us to be, the dream, the vision that he has for our life. That your pain is able to become your platform. That your mess is able to turn into a message for the world. And the greatest trial or tribulation that you might face can actually become the greatest testimony the world has ever heard or seen. This is the redemptive story of God. And Joseph, once again, he... He says that over and over throughout this whole portion of scripture, and he says it again in Genesis 50, verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. What is that? The saving of many lives. So God can't be trusted God will bring redemption, but God also invites us into the bigger story. There's more to this. Let me say it this way. The redemptive power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, listen carefully, does not end with us. It continues through us. The redemptive power of the gospel of Jesus Christ was never meant to just come to us and stop, but to continue through us and lived out through us. But there are some cultural constructs or even theological ideas and idioms that are said that are beautiful and true, but they're just incomplete. So we'll say things like, God loves me. I count my blessings. God restored me. God healed me. God saved me. All of those things are true and beautiful and wonderful and ought to be said. But listen very, very, very carefully. They're incomplete. The better, more completed way to say these things is that God loves me so that I can love others. I count my blessings, not just to practice gratitude, but so that I can be a blessing to others. I've been restored, I've been healed, I've been saved. Not just for my own well-being, but so that God can use me to do the same of restoration and healing and salvation in someone else's life. It wasn't meant to just stop with us. It isn't just for our status and well-being. It is for the service and salvation of many lives. Your story it isn't just for you. God intends it to be used to make an impact in the world as we love God, love people, and finish it with me, change the world. You have a story and you have pain from your past that you are carrying in this room today. What are you going to do with all of that? 
We drink our coffee. We enjoy our Sundays. The service is great, but I'm here to tell you, I'm not doing this for your entertainment. Whether you like it or not, it isn't for that purpose. I'll tell you my agenda. It is to help you take a next step closer to Jesus. And for some of you in this room, it might be your very first step with Jesus. To finally realize that you cannot do this life on your own. You need to surrender to the Savior of the world and put your faith and trust in Jesus. But maybe you're here and you're, and you're, you've been here for, for years whether it's this campus or South Barrington or another campus, and you've been walking with the Lord for years. And you come on Sundays, and you're blessed. And then Monday comes, and Tuesday comes, and each and every week, we just do this. But the church is not a building that we just come and sit in. It's a movement of people who are taking next steps with Jesus as we love God and we love people and we change the world, saying, God, use me. As Rebecca's story said, I can't just sit on this comfy couch or these comfy chairs and, and drink our coffee because eternity's at stake and I have a story to tell and I've, I've, got, I've got people in my life that, that need to know about this truth of redemption and restoration so what will you do about it today? Will this just be another Sunday? Or will this be the day that we finally trust the Lord and we take this next step and say, Lord, I accept the invitation into the biggest story that you're telling this world. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is the greatest rescue redemption story ever told. And he's inviting us to be a part of it. So today, we have simple but impactful ways for us to serve. It isn't just to check off a list because we have an opening. It isn't just where's the need we don't want to say need. It isn't about our need. It's more about your opportunity to use your story, to use your gifts, to make an impact and a difference and to spread the gospel and to see people saved. This is what we're trying to do. And I can't say it enough. And perhaps you're here and your pain has paralyzed you but I just hope you're reminded today that God can use it all for his glory and for our good. Heavenly Father, thank you for the story of Joseph and the many stories that are represented of those who have experienced heartache and pain and have seen the light of Jesus. God, I pray today that you would move our hearts to take that next step with you. That, Lord, eternity's at stake. And it isn't just for our well-being to be restored, but, Lord, so that we can serve and make an impact in others' lives. God, we love you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name, amen.